Hi there, listeners. Welcome to this month's episode of Research Roundup. I'm your host, Dr. Brianna Stubbs. As part of my job, I tend to read a lot of scientific literature, a lot. So we're going to be diving into the latest and most exciting things that I've been reading about, walk you through the experiments, discuss the results, implications, and share my thoughts on the study and the subject as a whole. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this episode, along with any studies or topics that you'd be interested in hearing me talk about in the future. So please write in at podcast at hvmn.com or find me on Twitter at Brianna Stubbs. Let's get into this week's episode. Today, we will be getting down and dirty with the creepy crawlies colonizing your insides, the cast of critters making up your gut microbiome. The word microbiota represents an ensemble of microorganisms that reside in a previously established environment. Gut microbiota, formerly called gut flora, is the name given today to the microbe population living in our intestine. Now, our gut microbiota contains tens of trillions of microorganisms, including at least 1,000 different species of known bacteria with more than 3 million genes, which is actually 150 times more than we have human genes. Microbiota can in total weigh up to two kilograms. One third of our gut microbiota is common to most people, while two thirds are specific to each one of us. In other words, the microbiota in your intestine is like an individual identity card. While each of us does have a unique microbiota, it does always fulfill a conserved physiological function that all have direct impact on our health. Some of the functions include helping the body digest certain foods that the stomach and small intestines have not otherwise been able to digest, producing some vitamins, for example, vitamin B and vitamin K, combating aggressions from other microorganisms and maintaining the wholeness of the intestinal mucosa. And finally, a healthy and balanced gut microbiota is key to ensuring proper digestive function. So taking into account the major role that the gut microbiota plays in normal functioning of the body and the different functions it accomplishes, experts nowadays consider it as an organ. However, it is an acquired organ. As babies are born sterile, that means to say that the intestinal colonization by bacteria starts right after birth. The balance of bacteria in our guts can be affected during the aging process, and consequently, the elderly have substantially different microbiota to younger adults. As I said before, the general composition of the intestinal microbiota is broadly speaking similar in most healthy people. The species composition is highly personalized and largely determined by our environment and our diet. The composition of gut microbiota may become accustomed to the normal components of your diet, either temporarily or permanently. Japanese people, for example, can digest seaweeds, which are part of their daily diet, thanks to specific enzymes that their microbiota has acquired from marine bacteria. Although it can adapt to change, a loss of balance in the gut microbiota may arise in some specific situations, and this is called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis can be linked to many health problems, such as functional bowel disease, inflammatory bowel disease, allergies, and even obesity and diabetes. So today, we're going to have a look at three research papers that show how powerful our diet can be in altering our gut microbiome, and how that in turn affects our overall health. The first paper is called Diet rapidly and reproducibly alters the human gut microbiome, which will give us a general overview of the diet microbiome interaction. Then we'll look at fasting and the ketogenic diet as two strategies that modulate the microbiome with our second paper titled The Gut Microbiota Mediates the Anti-Seizure Effects of the Ketogenic Diet and our final study called Intermittent Fasting Promotes White Adipose Browning and Decreases Obesity by Shaping the Gut Microbiota. Without further ado, why don't you pop a squat and let's dive in. And I'm going to apologize now in advance for a small splattering of toilet humor and also for any terrible pronunciation of bacterial species names. First up, let's look at the 2014 Nature article titled Diet Rapidly and Reproducibly Alters the Human Gut Microbiome. In this study, researchers based at UCSF took 10 healthy American participants, all by one of whom ate a mixed omnivorous diet, and then they asked them to make extreme changes to their diets for five days straight and took stool samples and measured the changes to their microbiome. Everyone's microbiome fingerprint was studied before they changed their diets, and the subjects were also followed for six days after each diet had ended in order to see if changes were reversible and if so, how quickly was this happening? The two diets studied here were a plant-based diet and a diet containing only meats, eggs and cheese. Subjects on the plant-based diet ate cereal for breakfast and pre-cooked meals made of vegetables, rice and lentils for lunch and dinner, with fresh and dried fruits being provided as snacks. Subjects on the animal-based diet ate eggs and bacon for breakfast, which sounds great, and cooked pork and beef for lunch. Dinner consisted of cured meats and a selection of four cheeses. 
Snacks on this diet included pork rinds, cheese and salami, which all sounds pretty good to me. And you should go back and listen to some of our previous podcast episodes where we've talked in more detail about the carnivore diet. While both diets affected the abundance of certain gut microbes, switching to an animal-based diet had a bigger overall effect. One of the most surprising things here was that most of the changes happened within one day of starting the diet. Once people stopped the animal-based diet, their microbes settled back into an omnivorous profile within a day or two. So all of these changes are happening quickly and reversing quickly. Previous research had indicated that stability was the norm for the human microbiome, but all previous studies had taken single microbiome snapshots, or a series of microbial profiles spaced months apart rather than days. So as soon as you start to measure on a shorter timeline, that's when you start to see increasing variability around a somewhat stable baseline. When volunteers switched to the animal-based diet, certain species of bacteria rose to prominence. And the species that became more popular were bacteria that could withstand bile, which the body releases after a person eats fat. On the meat diet, the bacteria inside the gut also began to pump out short-chain fatty acids. And some of these fatty acids have been associated with inflammation in animal studies, although this study here did not measure long-term health effects. And I found this quite interesting to contemplate how this observation might fit with stories of suppressed inflammation on the carnivore diet that has been discussed, as I said, in some of our previous HVMN podcasts. So for me, one of the key takeaways of this paper is that our microbiome can change really quickly and transiently. So if you want to make a profound change to your microbiome, you might need to make changes and then stick to them. The authors of this study hypothesized that rapid changes to the gut microbiome might have played a key role in human evolution, saying that consumption of animal foods by our ancestors was probably volatile, depending on season and foraging success with readily available plant foods offering a fallback source of calories and nutrients. Therefore, microbial communities that could quickly and appropriately shift their functional repertoire in response to diet would have subsequently enhanced human dietary flexibility. Next up, let's look at a specific example of how changing the diet affects the microbiota, which can then in turn drive a major clinical endpoint. This was studied in a paper published this summer in Cell Metabolism called The Gut Microbiota Mediates the Anti-Seizure Effects of the Ketogenic Diet. As we've discussed in many an HVMN podcast, the ketogenic diet has a number of health benefits, including reducing seizures for children with epilepsy who do not otherwise respond to anti-epileptic medications. In fact, the ketogenic diet has actually been used to treat drug-resistant epilepsy for over 100 years before the discovery of most modern drugs. Up until now, there's been no clear explanation for exactly how the diet can help these children with epilepsy. So in this study, UCLA scientists identified that specific gut bacteria can play an essential role in the anti-seizure effects of the high-fat, low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And this study is actually the first to establish a causal link between seizure susceptibility and the gut microbiota. The research team conducted a comprehensive investigation using a mouse model of seizures. Firstly, they put the mice on the ketogenic diet and confirmed that it was protective against seizures. Like in our first paper, the researchers found that the ketogenic diet substantially altered the gut microbiota in fewer than four days. To test whether these diet-induced changes in the microbiota were important for protection against seizures, the researchers analysed the effects of the ketogenic diet on two types of mice those reared as germ-free in a sterile lab environment, meaning that they never had a gut microbiome, and mice treated with antibiotics to deplete gut microbes. In both cases, the ketogenic diet was no longer effective in protecting against seizures, even though the mice had elevated ketones, which had been hypothesized to have an anti-seizure effect themselves. These results suggest that the gut microbiota is required for the diet to effectively reduce seizures, and having elevated ketones alone might not cut it. The biologists then used DNA sequencing to identify the types of bacteria that were elevated by the diet and play a key role in providing this protection. With this new knowledge, they studied germ-free and antibiotic-treated mice that were then supplemented with these bacteria. Interestingly, they found that they could restore seizure protection if they gave these particular types of bacteria together, but not alone. When given alone, there was no protection against seizures, suggesting that the bacteria perform a unique function when they're together. Finally, the researchers did a faecal transplant, or less scientifically, repopulating the gut microbe from the mice-fed the ketogenic diet into mice-fed a controlled diet, and they found that this was also protective against seizures. Overall, quite an unorthodox use for poop. So what could the bacteria hiding out in the gut be doing actually to stop the mice having seizures? 
The researchers measured levels of hundreds of biochemicals in the gut, blood, and hippocampus, which is a region of the brain that plays an important role in spreading seizures in the brain. They found that the bacteria that were elevated by the ketogenic diet altered levels of biochemicals in the gut, blood, in ways that affected the neurotransmitters in the hippocampus. It's very interesting that the microbiome by itself could have such profound effects on the body. One cautionary note is that lab animals have very different exposures to germs than wild mice and also to humans, so it's not clear if this mechanism is as important in humans, although these results show that we should certainly be considering this as a possibility. Also, I'd say that the conclusion that changes to the gut microbiome, not the increase in ketones is the main effector mechanism of the ketogenic diet, is supported by the data here, but is not entirely consistent with other work which has has shown that ketones themselves can protect against seizures in both cell cultures and animal models. One example that springs to mind is Dom D'Agostino's work using an acetoacetate diester, in which he showed that giving exogenous ketones increased seizure latency in central nervous system oxygen toxicity by 100%. And this is done acutely, so no changes in the gut microbiome are happening here. So all in all, the results here are really interesting, so watch this space to see if similar findings can be replicated in humans. Moving on to our last paper of the day, it's another one that looks at how we can change how rather than what we eat to then change our gut microbiomes and trigger better health outcomes. The paper's called Intermittent Fasting Promotes White Adipose Browning and Decreases Obesity by Shaping the Gut Microbiota. So let's back up a little bit. There are two types of fat in your body, brown fat and white fat. The brown fat is a type of fat that burns energy. The white fat is a type of fat that stores energy. Brown fat is not common in modern adult humans, being found more in younger infants and in animals. So is there a way to turn our white fat into brown fat? There really aren't many options that we know of, but as some of you biohackers might know, exposure to cold can actually stimulate the production of brown fat cells in our bodies, and this is called shivering thermogenesis. Scientists are working hard to find a weight loss drug that can help to brown our white fat cells. Intermittent fasting is one such natural intervention that might have the same effect. It's another one of the research areas that we like to follow here at HVMN because fasting has such low barriers to entry and a low risk to reward ratio, and it can be adjusted to fit in with most people's lifestyles. Intermittent fasting raises ketones, decreases inflammation, triggers autophagy, and production of new brain cells. Guess what else it does? It can turn your white fat tissue brown. In this landmark cell metabolism paper, we're going to look at every other day fasting in mice. The intervention group did 15 cycles of every other day fasting for a total of 30 days, and they were compared to a control group of mice that could eat at will. The first eye-opening finding of this paper was that both groups ate the same amount of food, but the fasting group weighed less than the control group. This was because the fasting mice had a higher total energy expenditure compared to the control group, but this wasn't due to differences in exercise or movement. This was because the fasting mice had more thermogenesis, so heat production. And indeed, they actually did generate more heat than the control mice, as measured by rectal thermometers, so poor mice in this study. Thermogenesis was being fueled by fat burning, shown by measuring the respiratory exchange ratio of the two groups. The researchers then went to the microscope and found that the fasting group had more brown fat and had turned some of their previously white fat brown. These transformed fat cells had prominent features of brown fat cells, for example, more fat cell lobules, and you have to think of fat cells with baby fat cells attached to them, and higher amounts of an uncoupling protein called UCP1. This protein uncouples the protons moving down the mitochondrial gradient from the, for the synthesis of ATP, allowing the energy to be dissipated as heat in a process called non-shivering thermogenesis. So now it's time to look at the microbiome. The researchers did the usual before and after sequencing to see if every other day fasting changed the microbiome, and sure enough it did. They also did metabolic profiling and saw that two metabolites whose levels were increased in the mice, namely acetate and lactate, were known Beijing inducers from previous research. So they'd been shown previously to be able to turn white fat into brown or beige fat. Having identified these changes to the microbiome, they then did a microbiome repopulation from the fasting mice into the control mice and also into mice with metabolic syndrome. 
they saw that this transplant could trigger many of the changes that had been seen in the mice that were fasting, white fat beijing and also increased uncoupling protein expression. To confirm their findings, they actually looked at the effect of fasting in germ-free mice. And without the microbiome, the fasting did not trigger the beneficial changes. So it's not just what you eat, but also when or how often you eat that can drive powerful changes to the bacteria in your gut and affect your health. So I want to wrap up with some general thoughts that apply to all of these studies. Over the last few years, scientists have called the gut microbiome the new final frontier, which is ironic as it's close to home for all of us. It's clear that there are complex and deep-rooted links between what we eat, the bacteria we're exposed to in our environment, and many aspects of our health, our brains, our metabolism, and much more. It's amazing to think that there are thousands of bugs living inside us, talking to the huge cluster of nerves in our gut called the enteric nervous system, and thus having effects throughout our body. That said, the gut microbiome is a trendy topic right now, and as with all trendy topics, I suspect there will be some conditions where it's a key contributing factor, and others where there are changes that are correlated but aren't really driving the clinical endpoint changing condition. Many of the early promising findings from animal studies really need to be tested out in humans. And I think when we start looking at humans compared to animals, the picture will become far, far more complex. We still don't really understand how changing our diet can affect us as individuals because we all have individual microbiomes. So either changing your diet or supplementing with probiotics or prebiotics to try and change your microbiome might work better for some people than others. At the moment, one of the only ways that's scientifically proven to successfully manipulate the gut microbiome is repopulating people who have had a bad infection with a bacteria called C. difficile. This treatment can actually restore people's microbial diversity and improve their health. There's much more controversy about ways to use the microbiome to help in other conditions, so I wouldn't advocate finding yourself a poop donor just yet, but watch the space as science start to get to, wait for it, the bottom of things. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. Remember to check out www.hvmn.com forward slash pod for this month's special podcast offer. For January 2019, that offer is 25% off Sprint. It's a new year, folks. Time to hit the ground running. Are you interested in getting $15 of HVMN store credit that you can use on our website? I thought so. Submit a written review on our iTunes page and then send a screenshot to podcast at hbmn.com. That email line is always open for guests, topic ideas, feedback, and questions. So until next week, listeners, stay sharp and train smart.